Hi, I'm Rob, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. Today, I'm speaking with Miles Brundage, Research Fellow at the University of Oxford's Future of Humanity Institute. He studies the social implications surrounding the development of new te- technologies and has a particular interest in artificial general intelligence, that is, an AI system that could do most or all of the tasks humans could do. Miles' research has been supported by the National Science Foundation, the Bipartisan Policy Centre, and the Future of Life Institute. So thanks for making time to talk to us today, Miles. Thanks for having me. So first up, maybe just tell us a bit about your background and what questions you're looking into at the moment. Sure. Uh, so I used to work on energy policy uh, when I was living in Washington, D.C., and I've gradually moved into AI policy over the past few years because it seems like uh, it was more of a neglected area and could have a very large impact uh, so I recently started at the Future of Humanity Institute, and I'm also concurrently finishing up my PhD in Human and Social Dimensions of Science and Technology at Arizona State University. Uh, so in both capacities, I am uh, interested in what sorts of methods would be useful for thinking about AI in a rigorous way, and particularly the uncertainty of possible futures surrounding AI. Uh, and I have a few more specific interests, uh, such as openness and artificial intelligence and the risks related to bad actors. Okay. Um, so are you trying to pr- predict what's going to happen and when and what sort of effects it will have? Uh, so not necessarily predict per se, but at least understand what's plausible. I think that it's very difficult to predict with any a high confidence what's going to happen and when, but understanding, for example, what sorts of uh, actions people could carry out with AI systems today or in the foreseeable future uh, in different domains like cybersecurity uh, uh, and information operations, uh, d- production of fake news automatically and uh, autonomous drones and so forth. I think understanding the security landscape of those sorts of things doesn't necessarily require very detailed forecasts of when exactly uh, something will occur, so much as understanding what's technologically possible uh, given near-term trends. And then uh, you, know, you don't necessarily have to say this is when the uh, this particular accident or malicious behavior will occur, but just uh, that these are the sorts of risks that we need to be prepared for. Right, right. Does that bring you into contact with uh, with organizations that are developing AIs like, like Google or OpenAI? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So those organizations have an interest in uh, making sure that AI is uh, as beneficial as possible, and they're keenly aware of the fact that they can be misused and that there might be uh, accident risks associated with them. So, for example, I held a workshop uh, fairly recently on the uh, connection between bad actors and AI and what sorts of uh, bad actors we might be concerned about in this space, and uh, we had some participation from some of those groups. Right, right. What what kinds of bad actors are you, are you thinking of? Uh, I think there uh, you can look at it from a number of different perspectives. So depending on the domain that you're interested in, uh, you might end up with different sorts of actors. So in the case of uh, physical harm associated with AI, you might look at autonomous weapons uh, and the weaponization of consumer drones. And in that case, it's something that uh, would be particularly appealing to state actors as well as terrorists. And we're already seeing the weaponization of consumer drones, uh, though without much autonomy, if any, uh, in the case of ISIS overseas. So uh, there, there are cases like that where we can foresee that particular uh, groups, with, when given more advanced capabilities, such as uh, higher baseline levels of autonomy and consumer drones, uh, would like uh, w- would be able to and would like to carry out uh, damage on a larger scale. Uh, but in other cases, it's less clear. So for example, uh, there are concerns around mass surveillance, and it's often not totally clear whether one should be more concerned about uh, states or corporations, uh, depending on what sorts of risk you're concerned about. For example, um, corporations uh, currently have a lot of data on people, and there's there have been a lot of concerns raised about uh, the use of AI to make decisions that have critical impacts on people's lives, such as denying loans uh, and uh, you know court decisions and so forth uh, that are being informed by often not very transparent algorithms. So th- those are some concerns, but there's also a potentially different class of concerns around uh, s- uh, authoritarian states using AI for uh, oppression. So it's uh, I think there's a range of risks, but Generally speaking, uh, there's going to be a 
steady increase in the 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 floor of the skill level as these uh, AI technologies diffuse. That is, there will be more and more uh, capabilities available to people at the bottom of the scale, that is individuals, as well as people with more access to computing power uh, and money and data at the higher end. So uh, it's not totally clear how to think about that, because on the one hand, you might expect that uh, the the biggest actors are the most concerning because they have the most uh, skill and uh, resources. But on the other hand, they also are sometimes, in the case of democratic governments, uh, held accountable to citizens and, in the case of corporations, held accountable to stakeholders. So you might also think that you would be co- more concerned about individual uh, rogue actors. So uh, that that's an issue I'm still trying to think through in the in the context of the report that I'm writing based on that workshop. Right. So, so people often distinguish between uh, kind of the short term uh, risks from AI, like uh, self driving cars not working properly, or, or algorithmic bias, and then then the longer term concerns of what we're going to do once an artificial intelligence is uh, as smart as humans, or potentially uh, much much more intelligent. Which which one of those uh, do you spend more time working on? I try to focus on issues that are span different time horizons. So, I think AI and security is something that. We're already seeing some early instances of today, so it's already being used for detection of uh, cyber threats, for example, and the production of uh, vulnerabilities in software. There's a lot of uh, research going on, uh, with an example being the DARPA Grand Cyber or Cyber Grand Challenge recently, where there was automated hacking uh, and automated defense. Uh, so th- there's already stuff happening on the front of AI and security, as well as you know the economics of AI and so and uh, issues surrounding privacy. But uh, it's it's not totally clear whether the issues in the future will just be uh, straightforward extensions of those or whether there will be qualitatively different uh, risks. So I think it's important to think about what's happening today uh, and imagine how it might progressively develop into a more extreme future as well as to think about possible discontinuities when AI uh, progresses more quickly. Right, right. So I, I should say at this point um, that uh, we, we have a profile up on our website about um, the the potential upsides and downsides of artificial intelligence, where we go through uh, all, all of the basics. And uh, Miles, you have a forthcoming guide to uh, work on AI policy and strategy that uh, that we're going to link to. So so here we're going to try to go go beyond that. So if you find yourself a little bit confused, then potentially just go and read one of those um, one of those documents first. Um, so, uh, so which policy or strategy questions do you see as uh, as most important for us to answer in order to ensure that um, the development of artificial intelligence goes goes well rather than in a, in a bad way? I think there are a lot of questions, and some of the ones I was talking about earlier surrounding security and and preventing the um, weaponization of AI by uh, dangerous actors is is one. But one, uh, and there are also other issues that have been widely discussed in the media and by academics, such as accountability of algorithms and transparency, uh, the economic impacts of AI, and so forth. Uh, But one that I think is particularly important, particularly over the long uh, over the long term, and this is a case where there might be a need to think about possible discontinuities is coordination surrounding AI safety. So there's been a lot of attention called to AI safety in the past few years, uh, and there's starting to be a lot of uh, concrete and successful research on the problem of avoiding certain AI safety failure modes like wireheading and value misalignment and so forth. Uh, But there's been less attention paid to how do you actually uh, incentivize people to act on the the best practices and the, the good theoretical frameworks that are developed assuming that they will be developed. And that's a potentially big problem if there's a competitive situation between companies or between countries countries or both, and there's an incentive to skimp on those safety measures. So there's been a little bit of work, for example, uh, by Armstrong et al. at the Future of Humanity Institute, uh, looking at uh, arms race type scenarios involving AI, where there would be an incentive to skimp because you're concerned about losing the lead uh, in an AI race. And there might be significant, uh, we, we don't really know what the extent will be, but there it might turn out that there's significant trade-offs between safety and performance of AI systems. So uh, one might be tempted to, in order to gain an advantage, whether economic or military or intelligence-wise, 
ramp up the capabilities of an AI system by adding more hardware, adding more data, adding more sensors and effectors and so forth. Um, but that might actually be dangerous if you don't understand the the full uh, behavioral envelope of the system, so to speak, and how to constrain actors, the human actors from doing that uh, is a very difficult problem. So I've, uh, I, along with some others at the Future of Humanity Institute and others at different organizations have started thinking about uh, what is an incentive compatible mechanism to ensure uh, that people do the right thing in that case. That is to say, we don't want to ask people to do something that's totally against their interests. If they actually do have an interest in developing these systems and protecting themselves, themselves militarily or otherwise, uh, but we also want to ensure that they're constrained in some sort of way. So one example would be uh, an arrangement. This is not necessarily a fully fleshed out example, but just to, to illustrate the sort of thing I'm talking about would be some sort of arrangement between AI developers such that uh, in order to gain access to the latest breakthroughs or the latest computing power, uh, you would need to submit to some sort of uh, safety monitoring and, and uh, adhere to certain best practices. Uh, that would create an incentive if you want to be on the cutting edge to uh, to participate in those uh, safety protocols. So uh, that, that's, again, that's not a fully worked out example, but that's that's the class of things, that's an example of the class of things that I would like to see more of. So developing specific proposals for how to ensure that the right thing uh, that's being developed on the technical front actually gets implemented. Right. Uh, do, do you look much at, say, uh, what, what governments should be doing in this area, whether there's regulations that we should be putting in place or at least preparing to put in place in future? Yeah, so I think that that ties in with what I was saying a little bit in that uh, one might envision that uh, as AI capabilities develop, that it will be increasingly seen as uh, a matter of uh, national security that a country be on the, the leading edge. So I think it's uh, it's not super clear how to navigate that yet. Uh, I think there's some there's some low hanging fruit. So clearly, uh, in my opinion, it would be beneficial for uh, countries to have some experts in house uh, in their governments who actually know something about AI and are able to deal with crises as they arise, if they arise, uh, and to uh, be able to think carefully about the impacts of. Uh, uh, AI and the labor force, for example. Uh, so I think there there's some low hanging fruit and some policies that have been developed for dealing with some of the near term issues. But for the longer term issues, it's not super clear that we want to rush into into a situation where governments are uh, leading this. If if that would turn out to uh, you know only accentuate the the arms race dynamics that we should be trying to avoid. Uh, if if it's uh, if AI is seen even more as a national security issue in, in an unhar unhelpful way, so I think it's incumbent on those who are thinking about the long term policy issues around AI to develop a more positive proposal that involves not just uh, you know the U.S. government getting involved for the purpose of accelerating uh, American AI capabilities, but some more collaborative approach. Yeah. I suppose with with previous dangerous technologies like like nuclear weapons or chemical or biological weapons, there's there's been agreements to try to um, slow down their development and, and and deployment. Is that something that could potentially happen here at the international level? I think it's possible to imagine some sort of slowing down among a small number of actors, and we're fortunate that there is a uh, high concentration of uh, computing power and talent and skill in a fairly small number of organizations. So there's pretty much no chance of some random person uh, out competing, uh, you know, the top organizations at AI uh, in a surprising way. Uh, so it's possible that, you know, with, with some of the top companies and nonprofits, as well as uh, countries, they could coordinate in some sort of way uh, not to postpone AI you know, across society for a long period of time, but at least to be cautious uh, in the later stages of development and to allow time for uh, mutual vetting of, of safety procedures and things like that. So I think it's possible to imagine some sort of coordination, but uh, the, the technical and the political factors interact to a large extent. So to the extent that we actually have good safety measures that are efficient and that don't introduce a lot of overhead 
uh, computational or otherwise uh, into these systems, then we'll be in a better place to actually get people to coordinate because it won't be imposing a lot of costs on them. Uh, and likewise, to the extent that we're able to coordinate better, it will uh, will be in a better position to actually get people to implement those uh, those uh, mechanisms if they do impose some performance penalty. Right. So, so can you think of um, like any major bits of progress we've made on AI strategy questions over the last couple of years? So the example I mentioned of uh, the paper by Armstrong et al. Uh, called Racing to the Precipice is, is one example, and it presented sort of a stark uh, version of the arms race scenario, though I think you know, there are reasons to be or- more optimistic than, uh, than are presented in that paper. Uh, because you know they look at only a certain uh, you know set of assumptions as with any uh, model, but uh, more generally, I think there's been progress in the development of principles and and criteria for good policies in recent years. So, for example, with the Asilomar uh, conference and the set of Asilomar AI principles, I think that was a good step towards developing some shared understanding around uh, uh, the need to avoid arms races and uh, concerns over AI weaponization and so forth. Um, but uh, it's I, I still think that there's a lot of room for uh, progress to be made. So uh, there was a paper put out by the Future of Humanity Institute uh, by Nick Bostrom, Carrick Flynn, and Alec Def- uh, Alan Defoe recently that uh, looks at policy desiderata for the development of machine superintelligence. And there's a lot of good material there, but I think uh, they would be the first to admit that uh, we're still at the the, the high-level principle stage of developing these policies. So we, we have a better understanding of what we want to avoid than uh, than we did a few years ago and what sorts of what what a good uh, propo- policy proposal would look like, but we don't yet have anything uh, super actionable. So I think the situation is a bit analogous to uh, where AI safety was a few years ago, where there were uh, there was starting to be an articulation of what the problem was uh, with uh, the book Superintelligence and various other publications. And people were starting to take the problem seriously and started to have a vocabulary for what uh, what a solution would look like with uh, value alignment uh, and other terms being coined, uh, but there wasn't yet any, you know, concrete uh, research agenda. And you know, subsequently, there have been a lot of uh, concrete research agendas as well as technical progress on some parts of those research agendas, uh, with uh, work by OpenAI and DeepMind and others uh, leading the way. So I think that we're potentially in a similarly exciting phase on the AI policy front, where we have a, a decent understanding of what the problem is, uh, and you know, with with the example of avoiding arms races uh, being you know forefront in my mind at least, but we don't yet have a concrete uh we don't have you know clear models and uh, case studies that we can point to as as ways forward so i think that's the ne- next step is moving into more concrete proposals and uh trying to balance some of the trade-offs that have been identified in recent papers hmm. so it, it seems like <clears throat> excuse me it seems like a, a lot of the latest thinking in this area um isn't written up in public yet uh, partly because people uh don't don't want to you know publicize their views at this point or just because the it takes a long time to get papers published uh what, what do you think is the best way for someone who's interested in working in the area to get up to speed on the issues so i think um again it's somewhat analogous to the situation with um uh, you know, AI safety a few years ago. And I think the book Superintelligence was a, a big step forward on that front in terms of having a single reference to point people to. But uh, it's less clear if there's one single reference to point people to on uh, AI policy issues, though I'm hoping hoping that the career guide that I'm working on will be somewhat useful in that regard. Another resource that comes to mind is uh, a syllabus for a class on the global politics of AI developed by uh, Alan Defoe at Yale uh, and the Future of Humanity Institute. So that that's a very detailed um, list of resources. Uh, and I, I, uh, I'm sure there'll be a link provided uh, for, for this uh interview somewhere uh yeah and yeah so i I think that that's another uh set of resources so it's essentially a long list of um uh you know both formal uh you know academic publications as well as things in the more gray literature uh such as blog posts which uh is 
you know, I think the sort of thing you're referring to is, you know, things that aren't necessarily written up academically, but are, you know, somewhat accessible. But even there, there's still some things like, uh, you know, Google Docs that are used internally and so forth. So I think if, if, if based on reading those sorts of things, this is clearly something you're interested in, then uh, the obvious next step is just to get in touch with people uh, who are working on these issues and, and ask and, you know, indicate what your interests are. And there might be uh, things that aren't available online that they can point you to. Yeah, you mentioned the Asilomar statement of of principles. Uh, which, uh, do you just want to describe that? Sure. Uh, so, two years ago, there was a conference on beneficial AI held in Puerto Rico, and that led to an open an open letter on AI, and and subsequently some investment by Elon Musk in the Future of Life Institute, uh, which supported a lot of grants in this space. Uh, and I think that that led to a lot of attention to the issue, and there were you know thousands of people, uh, including a lot of AI scientists, who signed on to that uh, letter. And then subsequently, the Asilomar AI principles, uh, which were developed at a conference uh, two years later this year uh, at Asilomar in California, developed a more uh, specific set of proposals for what sorts of uh, things AI scientists should be thinking about. So not just you know the fact that there should be more research, but also uh, things like capability caution. So being attentive to uh, the fact that we don't know for sure what the upper limits of AI capabilities will, uh, will ultimately be. And the things I mentioned about avoiding arms races and uh, being concerned about uh, AI weaponization more broadly. So uh, I think that's a good example of developing, uh, you know, sort of a, a consensus view on what uh, what we want to see and what we don't want to see. We want to see AI benefiting society as a whole, and we don't want to see it you know, uh, leading to the accruing of benefits to a small number of people or to uh, you know, large-scale war or anything like that. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's encouraging to see not just that, but also the development of other sets of principles uh, through the IEEE and their, uh, their effort on ethically aligned uh, AI design. So, so I read those, those principles and, they, and they, they seemed quite strong on paper. Uh, do, you, do you think people are likely to, to follow through on them? Uh, I, think th- I think there's somewhat of a gap between the level of abstraction uh, of, of the principles and, and concrete uh, steps that people can take. So, for example, it's not totally clear what any individual uh, can can do to stop an arms race, uh, for example. But uh, I think it's a step in the right direction to know where where you're headed, and then uh, you know figuring out exactly what to do about that is is the next step. Yeah. So, uh, in in your guide, uh, you suggest that people could potentially work on AI strategy and, and policy questions at places like uh, Google DeepMind or, or OpenAI, where where artificial intelligence is actually being uh, developed. Um, what, what concretely could you see people doing at places like that if they took a job there? Yeah. So, to some extent, uh, people at those organizations are are doing something fairly similar to what I and my colleagues are doing uh, in academia, which is thinking about what the problems are and trying to develop solutions. Uh, I think the the benefit of being on that side of things is to uh, have more direct exposure to what's happening on the ground, so to speak, uh, in AI development. And I think that can be useful uh, for developing a set of what sorts of problems are actually cropping up uh, as a result of the development of capabilities that actually exist as opposed to uh, just ones in the future. Though I think it's also notable that uh, people at these organizations have been very active in the the efforts that I've mentioned, such as uh, raising attention to AI safety, which was an initiative uh, uh, that, that involved people at Google Brain and OpenAI and the concrete problems and AI safety paper. Uh, and people at DeepMind have been very uh, influential in, in calling for more AI safety work. And they've been publishing uh, fairly early on this matter relative to other organizations. So I think there's a lot of uh, reason to think that these organizations are, are playing a positive role. And I think it's it would be a good place to be involved in uh, sort of thought thought leadership on these topics as well as doing uh, direct research. And, and how hard is it to, to get a job at a, at a place like that? Because I, I would imagine they would only have a few people working on AI strategy or, or policy. Are, they, are these extremely competitive roles? I would say they're pretty competitive. Uh, and I think that's 
that's you know a general phenomenon in anything related to AI these days. Uh, you know, whether on the policy side or the technical side. Um, but I, I think that this is a growth area for sure. So uh, if, if one develops expertise in this topic uh, and has something to contribute, then I think there will ultimately be opportunities available uh, to you in the next few years. It's, uh, again, I, I want to you know, draw an analogy to AI safety where there was a lot of concern about, you know, will there be jobs in AI safety uh, you know, three years or so ago? And I think that deterred some grad students from working in this space. And now uh, the situation seems to look a bit better in that there's a fair number of advertisements for postdocs and uh, people being hired at top uh, top labs to work on these issues. So I think we'll probably see something pretty similar, uh, not necessarily it becoming not competitive, but uh, you know there being a little bit of uh, slackening over time as, as there's a need for developing larger teams to work on these topics. Hmm. And another path you've talked about is going into uh, politics or, or policy roles, for mm-hmm. example, as a congressional staffer or perhaps at a, at a think tank like the Brookings Institute or, or the National Science Foundation or potentially just going into party politics in general. Uh, what, what useful things do you envisage people could do there? Yeah, so I think in the same way that working at an AI lab would give you a better sense of what's uh, practical on the technical front, uh, working for Congress or uh, Parliament or uh, you know a political party would give you a better sense of what's practical on the political front. So uh, in addition to that, it, developing a better intuition for the 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 system that you're dealing with and what's what the constraints are, I think it's also potentially a good way to in, to actually influence what what's actually done by those bodies. So for example, uh, in uh, the U.S. Congress right now. There was just recently announced an AI caucus uh, to organize the discussion of uh, members of Congress on issues related to AI, with particular focus on issues uh, related to the future of work. But I think over time we'll see more uh, discussion of of the longer term sorts of issues uh, that we've been talking about in in those fora, and it would be useful to have people who are concerned about making sure that the right thing is. Uh, uh, is ultimately done working in those places and able to actually act on the best uh, the best current understanding developed by researchers and by practitioners. Yeah. So I would think a, a big risk of going into uh, politics or policy in general would be that uh, your, your career progresses, but you're not uh, specifically in one of the places that ends up, uh, you know, having a say in how these things go. Um, you, you just end up, you know, being, uh, you know, working in a in a congressional committee that that turns out not to be that relevant. Uh, Are there any roles that you can take early on or what can you do to make, to position yourself well so that you don't just get sidelined in the end? I think if you intend to work in politics, then you have to be somewhat opportunistic about uh, jobs and the ebb and flow of, of political opportunities. So uh, for example, um, if, you know, one, one congressional committee is declining in its relevance, uh, in terms of AI, then one should consider about, uh, you know, jumping ship towards somewhere that's more relevant. Uh, so I don't think that, you know, at taking one particular job will lock you in forever, uh, but building up some uh, political capital and uh, some uh, human capital in that area could be useful, uh, even if you ultimately want to switch to a different organization. But I would push back a little bit on the idea of, um, you know, not, not being relevant just because you're not at the uh, on the side of people, uh, you're not at the at the organization where people are developing the latest AI. I mean, as I as I mentioned before, I think that's a very exciting opportunity, uh, and you know, along with academia, it's it's a great great place to work on these issues. But governments still play an important role in uh, framing these issues and in convening discussions. So, an example of uh, an example of this would be the Preparing for the Future of Artificial Intelligence report put out by the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy last year, uh, which uh, you know w- was the result of four workshops that brought together uh, experts in a wide variety of areas in law uh, and economics and uh, AI technology and safety. And so I think uh, you still have an opportunity to frame the discussion and move the ball forward, even if uh, you're not uh, working in, in the latest labs. Yeah. So what would be some of the best places to, to apply to in that area? So it's, it's a bit tricky to answer that in general. It depends on 
uh, factors like what your citizenship is and uh, what what particular policy issues you're interested in. But some uh, fairly robust uh, recommendations would be to uh, look for uh, – for 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 a particular class of people that have technical backgrounds, one area to look at would be AAAS fellowships. So uh, the Ameri- American Association for the Advancement of Science has a, a fellowship program where they essentially put people in uh, rotations in organizations like Congress and uh, the executive branch where they can uh, implement some of uh, some of they can, you know, draw on their technical experience and someone with a background in AI would probably end up in an AI relevant organization. So I've heard a lot of good things about that being a good good way to develop uh, career capital and experience and, and understanding of how the political system works. Uh, but that's not necessarily, you know, going to result in being in the exact right location for, uh, for you know, solving AI policy problems the next few months. I, I think it's really hard to say where where that would be, uh, or even if there is such a place, because I think we're still, despite all the progress that's being made, in a relatively early stage. So uh, there, there isn't even yet a recommendation. Uh, there isn't even yet a nomination for the director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House. So uh, uh, otherwise, I, th- I would say that that is a good place to to go. Um, so uh, and likewise, we don't really know what the agenda of the Trump administration is on the AI front, uh, and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of discussion, but not much uh, institution building uh, in in governments at the moment. So, uh, I it's hard for me to answer that in general, but I think getting experience is a pretty uh, robust thing to do. Right. Right. Um, so a situation that uh, I encounter reasonably often is they meet someone who's really smart, who is very interested in this topic, who might be able to make a, a great contribution. But at the moment, um, they're just there aren't that many uh, groups that are that are hiring for these roles. Uh, so for, so you're at the Future of Humanity Institute, and, and I guess there's also the Future of Life Institute. Um, but but there aren't that many places that someone uh, can potentially uh, apply. Um, so I'm thinking, what, what what advice should I, should I give someone in that situation? Should they just uh, should, should should they continue studying, perhaps, or uh, you know, building expertise so that they're in a better position to to apply in future when when the number of positions grows? Or uh, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, again, it's hard to answer that in general. It, it depends on what what background the person has and and what sorts of jobs they're interested in. But I think. Uh, if one casts a fairly large net in terms of uh, what AI issues one wants to work on, there, there's a fair, uh, fairly large range of organizations. It's not just uh, it's not just FHI. There's also uh, the Center for the Study of Existential Risk, uh, the Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence, the Tech Policy Lab at the University of Washington, uh, and you know various faculty programs around the. Uh, uh, various academic programs around the country in the U.S. and around the world uh, are looking to hire people, for example, as postdocs or faculty member in in areas related to AI and policy. If if you if you're someone with an academic background, and there are probably a fair number of policy of policy positions at uh, tech companies that aren't necessarily specific to AI, but that would lead to getting valuable experience uh, in the broad area of tech policy. So um, again, yeah, you know, one. I guess to generalize a bit, I would recommend casting a fairly large net uh, and you know working in adjacent areas if you can't immediately work in the exact right right place uh, because this is not some this is not the sort of area where you know people have been working on AI policy for decades and you know you, it's hard to break in for that reason. It's more just uh, that it's it's still a field that's growing and I I don't think that that growth will stop. So I think there will be more opportunities in the future. But if if you can't find the right uh, opportunity now, then, uh, then you know, again, talk to people uh, uh, in the field about what sorts of opportunities are on the horizon, and and try and work in adjacent fields. That might be one thing to consider. Yeah. So, what do you think would be the biggest challenges for someone uh, setting out trying to start a career in this area? Uh, depending on one's background, I think the the main challenge would be. Uh, uh, boning up on areas of weakness. So, for example, if you have a policy background, you might want to focus on uh, learning more about AI. And uh, if you have a technical background, you might want to f- focus more on learning about policy. Um, I, I think one of the challenges 
uh, challenges is what you mentioned before about there not being a super uh, clearly accessible literature on the topic. And I, I think there's some effort being uh, going into addressing that with the career guide and the bibliography that I mentioned. Um, but I'm not really sure that there's uh, you know any any specific set of pitfalls that I would recommend that people avoid besides you know uh, not um, you know neglecting the the areas in which uh, they're weak and you know don't don't try and rest on your laurels in say technical areas or policy areas because it's a fairly interdisciplinary uh, area and you would need to uh, think about um, you know what what sorts of disciplinary perspectives would be beneficial to solving the the problem you're interested in and not just uh, what is your background though of course you want to draw on your strengths mm. I guess because it's a it's a field that's at its fairly early stages and is and is uh, growing quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, it it'd be a good fit for someone who was you know really able to set their own direction and and meet people and potentially attract funding to do what they want to do. Someone who's you know going to cr create the opportunities that they want to go into. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I yeah, it's it's an area that's evolving, and I think a lot uh, a lot of the organizations that exist today. Uh, and I have mentioned as as you know good good places to work and so forth didn't exist five years ago. So uh, well, some of them didn't exist one year ago. <laughs> yeah, some of them didn't exist one year ago. So uh, it's it's an area in flux, and uh, I think you know as with politics, you should be opportunistic about you know thinking about um, what what sorts of um, you know what, what's the right place for you to be in. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's it's a very exciting area to work in, and I think that a lot of people will find that uh, you know it's it's an area that would benefit from their their background. Mm. So, so if you had someone who could uh, go into any kind of organizational role and and that'd be a good fit for it, what what kind of uh, person would you think is most valuable out of everything? Most valuable person. I don't really have an answer for that. I don't have an answer to that. <laughs> yeah. Or is there any? Is there any uh, say vacancy out there that you think you know you just wish that someone someone could fill it? Um. I mean, one uh, one air vacancy that that comes to mind is uh, for the policy researcher position at DeepMind. So they're currently hiring for for someone to specifically look at AI policy. So. Uh, I think you know the the case is pretty clear that that would be a good place to work and a good role to have if you're interested in influencing the conversation around AI policy and being exposed to the latest developments. So, uh, yeah, if you're if you'd be a good candidate for that, then and you're interested in that, you should definitely apply. Mm. So, so sometimes uh, I, f I find people who want to work on AI policy because they don't see themselves as, as quite cut out for, for technical core research, perhaps because their, their math skills aren't, aren't quite good enough. Um, is that a sensible way to go? Or, or is in some ways the, the AI strategy work uh, harder just because it's, it's, it's less clear, it's, it's less precise than, than technical work? Um, I wouldn't say it's harder or easier. It's just different. Uh, but even even on the technical side, there's there's a lot of uh, fuzziness. So, uh, you know, AI safety wasn't very crisply defined a few years ago, and it's starting to move more in the direction of technical rigor. And I think the same thing will happen to AI policy to some extent, but there'll also always be some element of uh, relationship building and and you know qualitative analysis and and so forth that uh, that that certainly is is you know not not exactly the same as as solving technical problems. So uh, yes, I do think that having uh, a different background would it, it would make sense to choose different areas to work based based on your background. But I wouldn't say that uh, you know working on the safety problem is totally technical and the policy problem is totally non technical. Uh, but certainly there's some correlation there. And what kind of level of technical um, understanding do do you have to get to in order to be able to make a useful contribution? Um, I'm not sure that you need any specific level in order to make some contribution. So, uh, for example, there there are a lot of roles that that could be played by people who are just you know good at distilling the literature on a particular topic. So, for example, if we're interested in uh, understanding the role that AI could uh, play. Uh, in authoritarian states, then you don't necessarily have to have any technical background to you know, read up on the literature around surveillance and uh, coercion and, uh, and and things like that. So I think there's a lot of room for uh, just good synthesizers and, and people who are curious and interested 
to dip into areas they're unfamiliar with. Um, but I think there's also a fairly high ceiling for you know what would be useful. So I think it would also be good to have people with very strong technical backgrounds thinking about the you know the the nitty the nitty gritty game theory issues related to arms races and so forth. So I think you know it's a pretty it's a pretty broad range of possible uh, skill sets that would be useful. Right. So, so you're thinking if you can just understand what you can speculate about what an AI might be capable of, of doing in the future. And then say if you know economics or if you know social science and you can think, well, what implications would that have for politics and that kind of thing, even if you don't understand specifically how the how the AI would work? Yeah, I mean, ideally, you'd know a little bit about uh, about each of those things, but you don't need to be an expert in everything. It's impossible to be an expert in everything. So uh, you it's not uh, you know, feasible to, to learn about every every single discipline of, of which I'll list several in this uh, policy uh, career guide that that you mentioned. Uh, and, you know, clearly you cannot be an expert, uh, you know, a deep expert in you know technical AI, economics, sociology, political science, etc. Uh, but knowing a little bit and and being able to collaborate with people with complementary skill sets is also very valuable. So uh, I think a lot of the the most exciting work in the next few years will involve collaboration between people on the technical side and on the policy side. Right. So, so how can someone tell which which kind of paths they're they're most suited for? Um, uh, I don't think that there's any clear algorithm for this, but talking to people in the area and and you know reading uh some of the literature and thinking about where uh where you think the gaps are, what uh what areas you think that you could shed light on given your background is definitely something uh you should do uh you should look at what sorts of job opportunities are available and you know cast a fairly broad net because you don't necessarily know what what's going to strike your interest until you stumble upon that opportunity uh and networking is also super helpful so i think you know not just in terms of finding out about job or job opportunities and figuring out where there's a nice fit, but also finding out about uh, different organizational cultures and uh, where you might fit in is uh, also useful. So um, yeah, I I don't think there's a a single algorithm, but networking and reading more of the literature and looking at job job postings are all good things to do. Yeah. What what kinds of uh, places can people uh, network? Are Are there any events that are open to people who don't yet have roles? Yeah. So, uh, all of the AI conferences are open to anyone who is capable of, uh, you know, ma- uh, you know, paying paying for the trip and the the ticket. So, uh, so some examples of of big AI AI conferences are NIPS, ICML, uh, IJCI, um, Triple AI, and so forth. Um, uh, you know, NIPS is you know the probably the biggest. Uh, um, you know, machine learning conference right now with with an emphasis on deep learning. ICML is also a very large one. Actually, I'm not sure which one of those is bigger. Uh, I haven't been to ICML, but I've been to NIPS a few times. Uh, and iClear, ICLR, is uh, also a deep learning specific uh, conference. So I think going to conferences like that and specifically going to workshops and symposia that are relevant to policy questions, which often happens at these conferences. Uh, so, for example, at NIPS last year, there was um, there was a symposium on AI and the law. So uh, there there are opportunities like that to network and to find uh, find out more about how people in that area are thinking and to to meet people um, who have similar interests. Um, and you know that's just on the AI side. There's also uh, it's also worth thinking about uh, more policy oriented conferences. So there's some conferences like the Governance of Emerging Technologies Conference, uh, the We Robot Conference Series. Uh, and probably a few others that would be of interest uh, to people who are, you know, either on the technical side, want to move into more thinking about policy side, or just they're in the policy side, but they want to, you know, specifically seek out people interested in AI. Uh, th- those would be good places to look. Mm. And, and are, are any of the organizations involved open enough that uh, someone who's interested in the area uh, can can drop by and, and get to know people? Yeah. So, um I think uh, particularly on the academic side, though, you know, to some extent also at corporations, uh, there's a fair amount of openness. And, uh, you know, for example, at FHI, we host a lot of visitors uh, who just want to learn more about our work. And the same is true of other organizations I'm familiar with. Yeah. Um, 
So, so it sounded like in your guide you thought that the best undergraduate major was was something like combining a technical uh, subject like maths or computer science with a more social science uh, topic like uh, you know politics or, or economics. Um, assuming that most people listening to this have have already uh, chosen chosen their major, mm-hmm. uh, what what should people do uh, at the postgraduate level? Should should they do a PhD or just go and work directly at, at Google if they can? Hmm. I. I mean, I've I've probably said this a million times, but I don't think there's a clear a- yeah, a- right. answer for everyone. <laughs> uh, but uh, but certainly, you know, it doesn't hurt to have an advanced degree. Of course, there are opportunity costs, but there there's certainly more job opportunities available for someone who uh, you know ha- has a PhD. So, for example, um, I don't know if it's a hard requirement, certainly, uh, but certainly it, it would be a benefit for people applying to a fair number of industry jobs uh, if they had an advanced degree, um, as well as in academia. So, I mean, it, it's hard to avoid the fact that, uh, you know, for uh, academic jobs, as much as, uh, um, you know, we would like to, you know, hire people solely based on, you know, their demonstrated skill, it's often also the case that there are university policies surrounding, you know, what sorts of degrees you need for for different roles and uh, pay grades and so forth. So uh, there's definitely value to having a graduate degree, uh, despite the, you know, non-trivial opportunity costs if if you have an opportunity. But, uh, you know, as with all of these things, it, it depends on someone's background. And if you have a clear opportunity to make an impact, uh, and you could, you know, perhaps get some of the best of both worlds by, you know, also taking, you know, classes online or enrolling at a local university and being a part-time PhD student or a master's student. I think, you know, you should, you know, there might be ways to have your cake and eat it too, but uh, it would depend on the particular person. Yeah. And and I guess the, the most obvious options at the postgraduate level are things like machine learning or computer science or, or economics, or I guess public policy, is, is that useful? Yeah, so uh at um you know just to to give a particular example um at Oxford we have uh a handful of people who are interested in AI safety and AI policy as well as you know broader issues related to the future um and you know just at the organization that I'm at FHI there are people who are either are currently enrolled or will soon be enrolled in programs uh in mine which is human and social dimensions of science and technology as well as machine learning uh cyber security and zoology so there there's a wide range of possible areas that one could study and uh you know find an advisor that is suitable and interested in supporting you know interesting work yeah. So so some people worry that, that doing work in this in this area could could be harmful if if not done well. Uh so for example, it could be that uh, as you were saying earlier that regulation in this area uh could could be done poorly and would actually be harmful overall or that bringing greater attention to the issue could could reinforce the the arms race dynamic or alternatively having people uh, get involved who don't have enough technical expertise could could bring the area into disrepute. Uh, how seriously do you take those kinds of concerns? Should should people be cautious about about uh, jumping into the area if they, if they don't feel like they're really on top of things um i think that it's a reasonable concern uh and you know there there is in fact some some risk of uh you know discrediting yourself or or your cause by uh, by being um you know too too alarmist or uh whatever the the particular charge might be but on the other hand there's a lot of noise in the system no matter what and, and you know whatever you whatever you do in the near term there will be terminator pictures and and, you know, <laughs> and people who you know dismiss ai safety and uh, all sorts of other things you can't really control so i i think there are also risks of not acting which is you know not uh, you know, not being able to uh, help out when you know there's an important problem and and you have something to contribute. So I I would say you know if if that's something that concerns you, then talk to people about you know your beliefs and what their beliefs are and you know whether there's you know how and look at surveys of experts and you know see see how uh, you know what 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 the you know reasonable distribution is among people who have studied the topic more. So uh, I don't think it's you know an all or nothing sort of thing where you either have to stay ignorant or you know be a super expert i think there's there's a middle ground where you sort of you know de- uh, develop your confidence little by little as you go and try and uh remain as modest as possible in areas that you have little expertise yeah and i suppose you can always just track the things that uh, you know people like you or, or nick bostrom are saying and, and how you speak about the issue so that you so that you don't come across as, a, as alarmist and you, you know you have a measured and uh, precise tone right right 
Yeah. So, so you mentioned earlier that that AI uh, could potentially be used in military applications, and that's one way that things could go badly. Um, mm-hmm. g- given that, do, do you see much value in people going into into military or, or intelligence roles to with, with the hope of limiting this uh, in the, in the future? Possibly. Uh, it's really hard to say. It would depend on the particular role. So, uh, probably a role you know higher up in the chain and more on the policy and strategy sides of things, as opposed to the more operational or logistical or just execution side of things, uh, would be more likely to give you an opportunity to to affect those sorts of things. But uh, it, there might also be benefits to that. Uh, beyond just uh, you know having a direct impact on the issue while in that role. You could also bene- uh, develop valuable connections and uh, know the right people to influence from the outside uh, down the road or uh, have a better understanding of the dynamics of the problem uh, and you know what needs to be done to solve it. So uh, I, I definitely wouldn't uh, dismiss it, but I also you know wouldn't necessarily recommend it you know across the board as, as the best thing to do. Yeah. I guess the intelligence services and the military are just such enormous bureaucracies. I suppose I'd I'd worry that someone like it's just unlikely, perhaps, that you'd be in the right place at the right time, or or have enough discretion in those roles to be able to make a difference. But as you say, it could it could help you to build up your career capital so you can get uh, other other good useful roles in future. And and you know how the system works, so you can potentially influence it uh, from outside and talk to the right people. Yeah, exactly. So uh, you know, it, again, it would depend on the particular person and what other options they have, but it's certainly worth considering. Mm. What about uh, what about foreign policy? Could could it be useful to go into you know the department so Department of State or something like that and and work on arms control agreements or, or you know even just current arms control agreements so that you uh, you understand how they work and can think about how they might work for AI in future? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think that could be very useful. Uh, looking at arms control and foreign policy, you know, both from an academic perspective and from a practitioner perspective, I think is very valuable. And it's something that uh, we're not, that's not our strong suit in the AI safety and policy community right now. Uh, so, you know, more, more could be done on that front. Uh, but I, I think, you know, some of the same caveats apply to the, the, as to the military and intelligence side of things that, that the state department, yeah. for example, is a very large bureaucracy. Yeah. Uh, and how do you feel about, um, just more general attempts to uh, to make the world uh, uh, better, such that when AI is developed, uh, things are more likely to go well. For example, just improving the you know quality of government uh, in general, trying to you know get get the right kinds of people elected, or or improving our ability to forecast the the future across the board. Mm-hmm. Is, is, is I guess one worry would be that that's just not sufficiently leveraged on on this specific problem. And if you think AI is is really uh, likely to be the key issue, then you want to work on that specifically. Uh, but but maybe if you can improve our ability to forecast technological changes in future across the board then that that could be a better option and and also um you know you just have a lot more options if you're if you're open to broader ways of improving the world yeah i i don't think there's a clear decision for everyone but it it both at the you know group level and at the individual level it might it often makes sense to take a somewhat of a portfolio approach so uh you know there are people at FHI, who also are affiliated with the Center for Effective Altruism and involved in you know building the EA community, uh, like Owen Cotton Barrett and Toby Ord. So there are people who straddle uh, that boundary and and you know look for opportunities to benefit both sides. Uh, and there are also people on uh, you know who focus on one thing or the other. So I don't think there's a clear right answer, but uh, certainly the the sorts of trade offs you mentioned uh, sound reasonable. Like on the one hand, one would want uh, the world to be in a better place for there to be more people who are thinking carefully about uh, making uh, making good decisions and benefiting the f- uh, future people um, in you know various important decision making roles. Uh, but there, it it's quite uncertain. You know what what impact you could have on AI. And likewise, even even if you work directly on AI, it's not totally clear that, uh, that that's always the best thing you should do. But, you know, I have a slight, you know, bias towards thinking that work that direct work uh, is, is, uh, you know, ne- needs more attention at the moment. Um, but uh, I think, you know, that you should take that with a grain of salt, because, you know, I would like, you know, more people to help solve the <laughs> specific problems I'm working on. So, so we should potentially continue trying to get people involved. Should yep. all just become uh, AI researchers right away? Right. So, so that's uh, that's all of my questions. Was there anything you wanted to add? Any inspiring message? Um. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I'll just sort of circle back on what I was saying earlier, which is that uh, AI safety was in a very uh, um, nebulous stage of development a few years ago, and it took the work of 
uh, Nick Bostrom in Super Intelligence and uh, Stuart Russell in uh, giving a lot of talks and writing op-eds to call more attention to it and give it more legitimacy. Uh, and then subsequent work was done to refine the issue and develop research agendas uh, uh, by by people, including the authors of the Concrete Problems in AI Safety paper. Uh, and now we have a lot of postdocs and graduate students working specifically on this. We have people in industry specifically working on well-defined problems in this space. And we have the opportunity to make a similar transition in AI policy over the next few years where we move from uh, fairly high-level desiderata and and problem framings to specific proposals and, uh, you know, uh, formal models and uh, you know, uh, you know, good white papers and so forth uh, over the next few years, and it's it's an area that would benefit from a lot of people's expertise. So I would definitely encourage people to uh, who you know think they might have some relevant expertise to seriously consider it. Hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll just reiterate that since since I wrote our uh, problem profile on positively shaping artificial development, we, we've heard from a lot of people who think that this is the the most neglected area uh, within within AI safety, uh, and, I, and I'm very keen to get uh, more people uh, working on the, on these problems and, and getting more organizations uh, hiring for them. Uh, so if it's something that you're interested in, I think uh, you should you should definitely be, be looking into it more, and, and uh, we'll put up uh, links to to guides where you can uh, find out more and, and meet the right people. Great. Uh, thanks so, for having uh, me, Robert. Yeah, thanks so much. Have a great day and look forward to talking in future. All right. Thanks. Bye.